Good morning, church. How are we today? Good? Let me try that again. How are we doing today? <laughs> Good. Can I, can I tell you guys a story this morning? This morning I woke up about an hour before I normally get up, went back to bed, woke up one minute before my alarm went off, hit snooze, got up this morning. I'm super tired. I uh, didn't brush my hair. Um, point of the story <laughs> is I, too, like Pastor Lance, didn't brush my hair this morning. So, <laughs> but, uh, if you guys want to rise to your feet, I'll uh, open us in prayer. Lord God, we, uh, we come before you this morning, God, and we just want to just lift you high this morning with our, with our praise, Father. We want to give you all the glory, Father, and, and just, just sing to you, Father. So we pray that you be with us this morning, Lord, and in your service. In your name we pray. Amen.
encourage you as we're singing this there'll never be anyone anyone like you our God um, I'm encouraged because um, it's cold out and it's getting colder and um, you know that can kind of represent our life sometimes where it's it's colder there are things that we don't like circumstances that aren't aren't panning out the way we hope or the way we'd like it um, maybe there are battles there are storms there are things in our life that we cannot control and we just get tossed to and fro it seems like life can seem like that sometimes and I know we can we can be stuck in that and and have feel like there's no hope but there is hope and we can sing these exact words that are God there will never be anybody like him there is none like our God in the earth in creation there's nobody like our God, our strong, magnificent God, our Father, and His Son, Jesus, you know Him, His Son, He paid a price for you.
Jesus. Thank you for being our hope, Lord. Thank you for, for being with us. God, for bringing us through those winter seasons, those cold seasons, those, those storms, those battles that we walk through, God, in life. We thank you that there is nobody like you, nobody that can carry us like you do. Thank you, Jesus.
this morning, God, we just, Father, we praise you. Father, I thank you for your presence this morning. God, I just pray, Lord, that Lord, in your presence, Lord, we would continue to glorify who you are. Lord, we thank you. I just lift up this time to you, Lord, in this service. Father, the rest of the service. Father, I pray that our eyes would, God, that they would remain on you. Lord, that our ears would be open. Father, in our hearts in a place willing to surrender. Father, willing to lay what we have at your feet. And God, during this, this season, Father, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be grateful. Yes, for the people and the things that are around us, but grateful that we have a king that is greater than any other king. Grateful, God, that God, we can come before you and find rest. God, find peace. Father, we thank you. Lord, we just pray, God, that, God, that you would be glorified this morning. Good to see you, everybody. I've got to open my notebook here because I have a list of announcements that I want to do before, you know, we dig into the word for today. And so anyways, let me just keep you uh, informed on a few things that's happening, that's coming up, that you'll want to know the shoe boxes. Um, I, I see that there's uh, people are bringing some of these shoe boxes back. Uh, if if you have a shoe box, and I've thought that yeah, the date's up there. So the twenty, so you have one week, 
One week, and then we need to have those back here so that we can get them sent off. So if you could make sure and bring them back next Sunday, that would be awesome. If you run into somebody or talking to somebody from the church that is not here today, remind them to bring their shoebox back uh, one week from today, and then Quinn and I will get them off, uh, and, and they are obviously going to kids all over the world. So you still have a week to grab a few empty ones if you want to fill some more, then uh, please do that. Also, marriage group, the marriage home group is happening this week on Thursday, so, so uh, don't forget that if you're involved in that. Uh, the ladies coming up have a trip to the Hobby Lobby, the shopping trip for the ladies and lunch or however and whatever they do on those trips. I've not been on one of them, so... So uh, get with Quinn and, uh, and, and participate in that. Also, um, I hope that you were here early enough to get some coffee this morning uh, because it's probably the last morning that we're going to be having coffee outside. It is supposed to be raining next weekend and we're getting into the weather that's cold in the mornings and so... Um, so don't plan on, I mean, I know it's an awesome coffee cart set up and stuff that's out there on Sunday mornings, but don't plan on coming and participating uh, with that after today. It's very likely won't be there, certainly not uh, till after the turn of the year and things kind of start warming up. So, uh, and we'll keep you informed on that. Also, December 1st, I want to... Um, so on December 1st, there'll be no kids' church, first of all. No kids' church on December 1st. The reason is, uh, is that Quinn and I have a very, uh, a young lady that's very dear to our heart. Um, she came up in our youth group in Montana. She now works in missions and does missionary trips. She will be here on December 1st. And, and I've, we've actually asked her to share a little bit with you guys, uh, and so we want to uh, hear what she is doing and, and where she's traveling and all of that, so we're really very excited to have her that week staying with us, and, uh, and then you'll get to know her a little bit and get to hear her story uh, and all that God is doing through her, and so, um, so we want everybody to, everybody to be able to hear and participate in that, so there'll be no Kids Church on the 1st. Also, the very last thing, flannel and frost, it's our Christmas party, it's on December 18th, you'll get more specifics to that, but last year was a riot, it was the, the, like the most fun all year long, so mark your calendars, you'll get more specifics coming up, but it's flannel and frost and it's Christmas, so I think that was it, so let's just take two minutes Stretch out. I know you've been stand, standing for a while and now you're sitting, but just say hi to someone. Uh, we'll get, you know, two minutes here to kind of relax and stretch and then uh, we'll dig into the message for today. So um, get up and say hi to someone and love on somebody. Uh, I am going to, um, I want to share with you guys today out of a very very common passage of scripture that you will all recognize, but maybe and hopefully we'll look at it a little differently than, than, than what you have before in the past, possibly. Maybe that's the case, maybe not. Uh, it's going to be David and Goliath. I want to talk about David. And, and the reason I kind of was going toward David and Goliath today is it doesn't matter if you've been in church, out of church, like, if you're a, a fairly normal person, you've heard the story of David and Goliath. You're, you're familiar with that. Almost, I mean, the vast majority of people on the planet have heard David and Goliath. I mean, there's movies that if they're not named David and Goliath, they're, they're, they're based on the premise of the story. Goliath is a giant, David's a boy. You know, and, and they square off in battle, and, and Goliath is very intimidating, and, and he 
legitimately would be intimidating. He's nine and a half feet tall, weighs over 500 pounds of pretty well brute strength. You know he has, there's, a, there's an aspect, it's not 500 pounds of Twinkies. I mean, this guy has it going on. He, he wears 300 pounds of body armor and fights in battle, and he is a warrior of warriors. The chief, like the best warrior, carrying 300 pounds. That's six sacks of Costco dog food on his body. His helmet is 50 pounds. I, I couldn't keep it vertical. It would probably... It, he's, he's a warrior, a warrior's. The tip of his spear is heavier than a professional bowling ball. I couldn't hold it on the end of a stick. I don't know if any of you... I mean, there's a couple stout guys in here... I don't even know if you can hold a, a, a professional bowling ball on the, the end of a, of, a, of a wooden stick just to hold it out there, and he hurls it through the air like a javelin. It, well, I, think we, I think we misunderstand or we just don't think about, like, this guy could be a very intimidating guy to face in battle. Uh, one of the things that we don't think, I, I, I never really think about a lot when I'm thinking about this David and Goliath story is that Goliath is certainly not the first giant that Israel or the Israelites had to face. And he's not the last one. And so what I wanted to do today is we'll kind of look at the David and Goliath thing, but I also want to look at the other encounters that Israel had with giants because there were many giants in the land. And when you read through the scriptures in several different books of the Bible, their giants are present. And I want to look at those other ones. And if we, if we look at like all of the encounters of giants, we're going to see a trend uh, happening. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of giving you a little bit uh, of what's at the end of the message, because I want you to be seeing the trend that happens every time they encounter giants. And so I'm going to start back at one of, the, one of the beginning places where they did, and that was in the book of Numbers, uh, in its verse, as chapter 13, verse 32 and 33, and it says, and you can follow along up uh, on, the, on the screen, it says, and so they spread uh, this bad report about the land among the Israelites. And let me just pause and, and give you just a, a bit of background here. The Israelites have, Moses is leading them out of Egypt. So they are no longer enslaved to Egypt. They were slaves there for 400 years. They have moved across. It's been about, you know, a week and a half. They've moved through the, the desert and are at the border of the land that God promised, uh, promised them, the land of Canaan. We would call it the promised land, but it's, the, it's just the land that God was promising Israel, a place to dwell. It's the land of Canaan, and there's a river, and they come up to the border where the river is, and they pause there, and they send spies out into the land, and those spies come back, and they've surveyed the whole land of Canaan, and they come back, and they're giving the rest of the people the report. Here's what we saw. I mean, the fruit and the vegetables off the charts. I mean, vines with, with, with uh, you know, grape vines that have a bunch of grapes that would weigh 100 pounds. I mean, they're just, it's an incredible fertile soil and, and good land. But here's also the, the report. They spread this bad report among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Now, instead of 
reading a whole bunch more, what happens is the people, they soak up that report. They're extremely terrified and afraid, and they lose their trust in God. God had delivered them out of Egypt, but with this report about the giants, and, and so we have to understand, the giants are pretty intimidating because the Israelites a week ago came through a Red Sea that parted and then came back and swallowed the Egyptian army. These giants are intimidating. And, and so a week and a half later, they end up turning back from the land that God promised them, and they spend 40 years in the desert, God patiently waiting for that generation to age out so that he could see if at least their children would trust him to go into the land. And so we have several years later, the children have grown up in the wilderness and now they're sick and tired of the wilderness and they're ready to, to take what God gave them. And so God takes them into, and they've trust, they've put their trust in God and they've won several battles. The walls of Jericho, that was the first one, right? They, they moved through the promised land they were trusting God, they were encountering uh, enemies, and they were defeating them in battle until they came to this region. And it was the region where the giants were. And they had been victorious all up to this point, and then they get to this point, and, and they're like, okay, we've got to start dividing. There's you know, the, the Israelites are 12 tribes, and so they're dividing the land up for each tribe. We want, you know, this tribe is this big. We need this much land for, for this portion of the tribe. And so there's one, one tribe of the 12. They're asking the now the new leader, Joshua, they're saying, hey, we need more land. Our tribe is too big for this property that we have. And here's Joshua's response in, in uh, chapter 17, Joshua 17, 15 and 16. He says, and Joshua answered them and said, if you're a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. But the children of Joseph said, uh, the mountain country is not enough for us. That's, you know, they're saying, that's right, it's not enough. But all the uh, Canaanites who dwell in the land and in the valley have chariots of iron, both uh, those who are of Beth Sheen and its towns and those who are in the valley of Jezreel. So they're, they're basically saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. We've been victorious this far, and I get it, and we have this land, and it, but it's not enough. But now you're asking us to go into the territory of the giants to claim more land? Oh, they have, they have chariots of iron. They're, you know, they're not going to come at it with the same complaint that their parents did, saying they're big, they're huge, we're like grasshoppers. But it's the same philosophy. They, they are extremely intimidated. And of course they are. What else would they know? They grew up with a people that were so fearful of the giants that they lived 40 years in the desert probably telling their kids, it's too bad that those giants weren't in the land because we could have gone in. But the people that are there, we couldn't have, we were like grasshoppers. So even though here's this generation, this new generation, that have never actually encountered a giant, they're totally fearful and intimidated because that's all they ever, they were never shown or taught anything different. And so now you have the next encounter that Israel has with giants is the story of David and Goliath. But it's not just David. It's an army of thousands. In fact, David arrives to the scene where Goliath is 
taunting the army. He arrives there with, with gifts of bread and cheese for the commander of the thousand that his brothers are under. Just one commander. So you have an army of thousands drawn a, ba- a battle line across the small little valley. There's another battle line of Philistines and giants, probably more than just Goliath, there's, but he's the warrior of warriors. But it's the land of giants, and so the, maybe not all of them are, you know, there, there weren't, you know, that many giants, but there were several. So there's probably several in the opposing army, but the, the best of the best is there on the battlefield. And so now you have this third encounter, uh, and it goes a little bit different, but, but here's what's happening in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8. It says this, Goliath stood and shouted, shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. You know, there's actually this battlefield is located in Israel, and, and it's been located, and they have the hillside and the other hillside, and I've even watched videos where, where a guy, they take a video camera, you know, and, and one guy goes up on the hillside, and the other guy goes down into the, the bottom there where it just kind of levels out there, and they shout back and forth at each other. And you can understand what, what they're saying. It's not that far. It's, this is not a massive valley miles of cross. It's small, but it's, a, it's a, a popular battlefield in Israel because of the way it's laid out. And of course, there's a brook right in the middle of it. So fitting. Uh, if you remember what David picked up as a weapon, you know, we'll get to that. But it says, <clears throat> so Goliath stood and shouted a, a taunt across to the Israelites, Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Saul is the Israelite king. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you'll be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight with me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Um, I'll refresh your memory a little bit. Saul has been anointed king. Uh, He is the the king of Israel, and it says that Saul, when he was anointed king, that he stood head and shoulders above the rest of the Jews. The the average height would be around 5'5", and that puts him at about 6'4", or 6'5", my height. Now, that's a big difference from nine and a half feet. But Saul was the leader of the camp and the biggest among the Jews. He should have been the one fighting Goliath. But he's terrified, and he's probably several people deep behind the line. And the whole army is terrified. And not only that, in verse 16, it says, And the Philistine drew near and presented himself for 40 days, morning and evening. For 40 days, twice a day, he's taunting Israel. Israel is terrified to go into battle. And and there's things about this that kind of jump out at me, like like when, when Goliath, you know, the Philistine champion... And one of the things that he says is, why are you all coming out to fight? When you read the whole story, you realize that they came out of, the Philistines came out of their region and they're in Judah. They're they're in Israel's camp. Israel didn't go over there and pick a fight with them. They came to Israel and he's saying, why are you even coming out to fight? You should just be running away. But if you want to, bring a man out here. We'll save, the, we'll save all these people and all this bloodshed. Just send one guy out. <clears throat> so the Israelite is an army of thousands, but they're terrified of the giant. Even though they're positioned for battle, they're too afraid to engage for 40 days, morning and night. 
So the fear is still there. The intimidation is still there. One person, and, and I would say it like this, because we need to apply the scriptures to, to our lives today. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe it's a thing. What is it that terrifies you? And, and, and I'll just be honest, like, for all of us, I think that this is a good, a good way to apply the scriptures to today is being honest with ourselves and saying, yeah, the reality is, is there are things in my life that I'm actually kind of, I'm, I'm actually kind of scared of. I'm kind of scared to completely trust God with my salvation, or I'm kind of a little bit intimidated to trust God to step out of my comfort zone. I'm kind of a little bit uh, terrified to trust God with my family. I'm a little bit terrified to trust God in whatever it is, in the new job, in the finances, in, in paying tithes, right, in, in giving a gift. I, I'm a little bit intimidated to trust God with something. And that's, that's how we need to apply this. Like, there, everybody has giants. He's not the only one, and this isn't the only time. Everyone will face a giant in their life. What is the giant in your life, and are we trusting God to get us through that giant? And so here's, what, um, here's what's happening, and I think that when we consider this, your, your salvation, your philosophy, your health, your children, your marriage, what is it that is a little bit intimidating or a lot intimidating? I believe that I, I believe that God wants us to face the giant in our life. Trust him beyond. In, in verse 41 of the same chapter, it says, Goliath walked down toward David with his shield bearer. So there's actually two guys, both armed. The shield bearer carried the shield that was the size of a man, and he carried a sword. And the shield bearer, for the most part, shield bearers in battle were not in front of the warrior. They were behind the warrior, and they shielded his vulnerable side and fought off anyone that tried to come up from behind. So the shield bearer was always a warrior himself. But so Goliath and his shield bearer... uh, Go out, he goes out ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. David is around 15 years old. He says, am I a dog, he roared at David, that you would come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. So Goliath is legitimately intimidating. He's ready to fight. He has a sword. He has a spear. He ha- he's covered in armor. And, and here is David, and you know the story. David grabs some smooth stones out of the brook as he crossed over to go to Goliath. Uh, okay, he has a shield, a sword, a spear, armor, and David has something not even sharp enough to hurt anyone or himself. I, 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 you know, a smooth rock is cutting nobody. He can't even injure himself with a smooth rock. And sometimes we feel like that, like I am not ready or equipped to deal with this thing that's in our life, to deal with the family, to deal with the, the job, to deal with the issue, to deal with the health crisis, to deal... We, we're just so not equipped. But in verse 48, it says this, As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. See, David's not like the rest of the army. He's not like the rest of his family. His brothers are actually in the army that's been cowardly, standing by for 40 days. David's not like the previous generations. So David runs out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out the stone 
and he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead, and the stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. Now let me just interject a quick question. Where's the shield bearer? He went out with Goliath. He's already running. So David used, he took the sword, Goliath's sword from its sheath, and he used it to kill him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Now, if you continue reading, it says the whole rest of the Israelite army chased them down and killed the, the bulk of them and chased them all the way back to their hometown, the city of giants. There, there has to be a turning point. There has to be a point in your life when you, even though you feel you're not equipped, you're not, it's, it's like you, you hear pastors say, and they'll encourage people, Come to Jesus just as you are. Because most people, when they first feel like, I need to surrender my life to God, they feel not equipped to do that. They feel like, man, God wouldn't accept me. God, this is not, you know, I'm so messed up. I haven't lived for him. Here I am. I've spent my whole life doing my own thing. And it's that same feeling. And there's the giant of trusting in God for salvation or the giant of trusting God to meet your kids where they need to be, or uh, the giant of trusting that God is going to make a way through the whatever it is, the storm. It's like what Gabby was uh, saying and praying during, uh, during worship. There, there has to be a place in which we realize our God is like no other. And we need to quit trusting in our stones are in the, the, the way that we're not ready. See, we trust in our own intellect. We trust in our opinions. We trust, and usually it's less, like your opinion of yourself is less than God's. He actually trusts you to be victorious because he's going to be there with you. And we trust ourselves. We trust our ability. Well, you know what? They, they just need me in this moment. No, no, they don't. What they need is God, and then you might be participating. That's what people need, or the job, whatever it is. We need to quit trying to trust ourselves and our own thinking and our own ideas and start trusting who our God is. And so, uh, <clears throat> So as I was saying in the beginning, there begins to be this, this shift where David actually breaks through and accomplishes something that generations before had not accomplished. He actually took down a giant, and he did it without the right, or what you would think would be the, the, the best weapon in the the perfect setup, the perfect scenario. It was reminding me, I was preparing this, it was reminding me of the story of the, of the and some of you probably might even remember it, the, the breaking of the four-minute mile. For 65 years, runners and trainers had trained and pushed to try to break a four-minute mile. And the one thing they knew is like this is an unachievable feat, but if it were achievable, it would have to be the absolute perfect day. Like it would have to be 68 degrees with zero wind, the perfect track of, you know, clay and, and, and stuff, the perfect running condition of the track, and a massive crowd. This was one of the list, one of the things that was on the, it would have to be a massive crowd to build the adrenaline in the runner to try to make. And if this, this literally is an unachievable feat unless, unless it's the perfect storm or lack thereof, everything would have to be perfect.
perfect for the four-minute mile to be broken. But then a guy broke it on a cold day while it was raining with a wet track and a small crowd. And because he did that, it showed the rest of the people, the rest of the runners, it is possible. And within 40-something days, another runner broke it. And by the end of the year, three other runners had broke it. And then the 65 years later, you remember 65 years they were pressing, it's documented, training in runners that they were pressing to break four-minute mile for 65 years. Within six, the next 65 years, almost 2,000 runners have broken. And you're not even competing if you're not running right around four minutes. Now, all it takes is one person to change, to break through where there hadn't been broke, something broken through before. And you look, and, and I can say, look at your family, look at your, your, your parents, your grandparents, look at, uh, look at the lives and, and, and re- start to recognize, okay, where is it that God wants me to break through? Maybe there is something that's, that's, been, uh, that's been coming down and been coming through the family or through society, or through the culture, and I need to break through because there needs to be a new standard. And, uh, and, and God wants you to set the standard in your family, to believe him like no one in the family has ever trusted in God before. Maybe they did to a degree. Maybe it's not that you're better, it's just that God wants a new standard, and he's going to use you to accomplish it. Maybe it's a jo- on the job, this severe of influence. Maybe there's people on the job that you're around every day that have never considered uh, like asking God and talking to God with what he would like for their life. But he needs you to break through and set a standard in front of them. And so there needs to be a, a, a new standard set, which, which makes me think, okay, uh, it's not about me. So, so when I'm asking myself, like, God, uh, why is this happening to me? Like, I'm trying to trust you. I'm trying to live for you. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to be a good person. And this is happening to me. Maybe it's not because of, maybe it's not anything that you're doing. Maybe it's not something that's bad. Maybe it feels like it, but maybe it's just God wanting to establish a new standard for everyone coming after you. It's kind of opposite of this, this uh, like a prosperity gospel where everything needs to be right and hunky-dory and everything is just huggy and fuzzy and it's all, you know, blessings and honor in my life and all of that. But wait, what, what about when tough times hit? And I go through the health crisis, or I go through the financial crisis, or I go through an emotional crisis. Does that mean that you've done something wrong? No. But that's the way that we we analyze it. Maybe God is just wanting to create a new standard. So let me just read the next few times that, that the Israelites faced giants. Now remember, you have generations of intimidation. You have one giant that falls, and now let's look at the other encounters of giants. In 2 Samuel 21, it says this, and I'm going to probably butcher these names, so don't, you know, you can laugh at me all you want. But Ishbi Benob was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword, and he had cornered David. Now, this is years and years later. David's an, old, an older guy. He is fat. He's fought multiple battles by now. From the time he was 15 years old, with God. now he's like 60 or 70, and he's still out on the battlefield. I mean, he, this is years later. It, but, but a giant was, was armed with a new sword, and he cornered David, and he was about to kill him. But uh, Abishai, Abishai, the son of Zerai, came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. Then David's men declared, you're not going out to battle with us again, because why risk snuffing out the, the light of Israel? Or saying, you're not going to go out, because if you die, then we're going to fall back into the intimidation. 
So we're not going to snuff out that because right now when you get in trouble, the young guys that saw you and heard about what you did and when you set a new standard, now the young guys are living up to the standard and when you're struggling, they just come alongside and take care of it because they have a little more energy. Right? This is the new standard. And when you continue reading, it says, and after this, there's another battle with the Philistines at Gob. And they fought, and uh, Sebekai from Huish killed Saph, another descendant of the giants. And, and this is the only time these guys are even listed in the Bible. During another battle, uh, um, during another battle at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jar, from Bethlehem killed the brother of Goliath, uh, of Gath, the, the brother of Goliath. And the, and the handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. And they said that about Goliath's spear. So he's, a, he's equivalent in size and strength. In another battle, the Philistines, at verse 20, Philistines at Gath, they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. I guess you need the extras to help balance yourself or something. 24 in all, and he was also a descendant of the giants, but when he defied and taunted Israel, see now, I don't, we don't have to fight. You, you, you talk bad about, about my brothers, I'm coming after you. See, Israel has a little different perspective now. And he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother. Oh, you're going to talk about my uncle, are you? See, there needs to be a new standard. See, in, in basically, in verse 22, these four Philistines were the descendants of the giants of Gath and David and his warriors killed him. David only killed one. His warriors killed the rest. And it ended the giants. And it ended the intimidation. See, what, ha what needs to happen, and, and here is just my heart for today, it's because no matter who you are in life, life has a way about throwing challenges at you. Don't naturally think that I messed up, I did something wrong, or anything like that. It's very important that you come through the challenge, and it's very important how you come through the challenge. Because the way you come through the challenge will set a new standard for everyone around you and those after you. It's not, challenges will be there. Don't be the person that's just bait, like, God, get me through this challenge. We should be saying, God, how do you want to proceed through this challenge? Because what, how I come through this issue will, will begin to build a standard for everyone around me. And I would even say it like this. The things that used to run in your family like the fear and the intimidation, they need, to, they need to run from your family. When you're facing a crisis, what, what runs in your family, if you don't set a standard, it will continue. But if you allow yourself to set a new standard, what, will, what ran in your family will begin to run from your family. And you'll watch your kids and you'll watch your coworkers and you'll watch your friends walk in victory because you did it first. And you set a standard. And it wasn't comfortable. And it, didn't, it, didn't, it certainly didn't feel good. But you trusted God. You weren't, you weren't going to cave and just barely stay afloat. You walk through it with peace. You walk through it with confidence. You walk through it with trusting who your God is. It's like my old pastor, you've heard me say it. I'm going to keep saying it probably for years to come. Would say we need sometimes to quit telling God how big our problems are and start telling our problems how big our God is. A different philosophy, but it sets a standard for everyone around you. And I know that you're thinking, Lance, get quiet already. It's food. There's potluck. So I'm going to close us in prayer, and worship team can come up, and, and, and we can close with a song. And 
Um, give, give a few minutes for those that are setting up the potluck over there. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give them a couple minutes before we go crash the party over there. And, uh, and then I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm excited because I feel, well, let me just say, for those of you that were able to come and join us for the worship night over at First Baptist on Friday night, that was amazing. That was, ama- that was an amazing night. And it, and it has me stirred, and I'm still kind of, I'm still stirred in a, it feels like there is, there is a shift. And I was talking with the pastor over there after the service, and he, and he was like, yeah, I'm feeling like there is, there is a shift where people in this region are going to begin to rise to the occasion. They're going to, you know, and I, I don't know, I th- maybe the whole election thing, I, I don't know if that's, but for whatever reason, it's like there's a stirring in people where their confidence, uh, they're going to become a little more bold, a little more confident. I hope it's not in the election stuff. I hope it's confidence in their God. But we need to we need to to move that direction and be, allow ourselves to start becoming more confident about you know what God I'm trusting you in this I'm trusting you with my life I'm going to trust you with my finance I'm going to trust you with my health I'm going to trust you with my kids in fact I'm just going to start making a habit and a practice and a standard in my life to trust you no matter what I'm facing. And I think that if we'll do that, God will say, okay, if you're willing to do that, then I'm going to get some people around you that will see you do it. And, and, and you'll, you'll set a standard both in your life and in theirs. And so let me just pray for you, and we'll close with some music and, and go get something to eat. Father, we love you and we thank you. God, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, there this stirring Lord, help us. God, help us to be cognitive of see, seeing the, the challenge, the giant, whatever it is in our life. Give us the vision to see it only enough to see through it. That we'd have, we'd have a confidence in you that wouldn't bring us up to the challenge, but would bring us right through the challenge. God, I pray in Jesus' name that for the, everyone that's here today, God, that you would create in us a standard that other people could look upon, that would influence, that would impact other people's lives. So, Father, I thank you and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, you can stand to your feet if you'd like, and let's close with some worship. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so.
So like I said, let's just give them a couple minutes to make sure they're set up over there. Um, if you can't stay, shame on you, but I guess it's okay. I'll see you all next door for the food and the potluck. We're all dismissed. <laughs>